All right, welcome to the shop. Um, I'm gonna work some more on the Hendy tool and gauge maker lathe. Um, maybe this might be part seven, not sure. I uh, had the parts laid out on the bench for the apron, cleaned everything, um, and was doing a lot of prep. Um, making sure everything was right all the pieces and parts before I put it together. Um, I don't know the name of the guy's channel, but he was taking apart a 10 double E, a Monarch 10 EE, and showed the apron and all the guts inside. And very similar to the Handy, um, except I think the Handy's a little bit more robust, and I'll kind of maybe talk about that. Um, the Handy's a, 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 a sort of made to compete in the same market as the 10 double E, um, at least the, the, the tool and gauge maker lathe. But uh, let me take your handheld, let me show you um, the stuff I've been working on. And I, I've been working on other stuff, uh, but I'm, I'm jumping back on this and a few of the things that I've addressed and, uh, and how some of the things work. Uh, if anybody else sees this video and, you know, a bunch of years later uh, and they have a Hendy, um, boy, that, that's a big stretch because not many of these Hendys were made. Um, you know, I mean, some of these old machines, think about it, they only might have made, I don't know, three, 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 four hundred of these things, and some of these machines that I have are, in reality, they're more rare than a, a Bugatti or a Maserati or a, some Lamborghini or Ferrari, you know, some old, a rare car, right? A 69 Mustang Boss 429. I don't know how many they made, but they probably made less of, you know, my uh, my Giddings and Lewis 25T or my uh, SIP jig bore, you know. Anyhow, enough talking. Let's go. Uh, let's go check out what I've been been work been working on. <laughs> the the mighty Rockford. I <laughs> give you guys a shot of the Rockford hydraulic open side planer. All right. All right. Uh, there you go. So. All right. Of course, that's the uh, saddle. Again, very similar to the 10 E Monarch. Um, so the, these are the gears. <clears throat> I had the, uh, the apron over here. One of the things that I've been doing is I've been clearing out these grease fittings. You can see that hole for the grease to travel. And, and what I did is uh, I cleared out the old grease with an oil gun. And I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. Um, here's the uh, stud for another. Well, that's the pinion for the input uh, from the hand wheel. And uh, like I said, there's a, 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 a grease zerk, a grease nipple, and there's the hole. <clears throat> it puts it right between two bronze bushings, bearings, bushings. Um, so the layout bench was, was over here um, that I got put together and all the pieces were laid out. Um, and let me take you and show you what I got going on here. Going here, the uh, hydraulic press. Okay, the mighty sip, which I believe is an MP5. But anyhow, Enerpack is a brand name. Um, Power Team is a brand name. Um, uh, Porta Power is a brand name. So what these are, what this is, is a hand-powered hydraulic pump. I got a short lever in there. These are made to go on a 3 8 hose with uh, one of these high-pressure couplers that's all rated for 10,000 PSI. And what you put on here is a jack. 
a hydraulic ram, um, different hydraulic accessories. Um, they got little uh, pincher foots that expand out, little wedges, I guess you'd call it. Different size cylinders, all different kinds. They're used in um, rigging and you know, set in structural steel. But anyhow, no matter what you want to call the brand name, these are just a hand hydraulic pump capable of 10,000 PSI. This happens to be an inner pack. I like it because it's kind of small. The reservoir, the handle is the reservoir, or you know, the, the body is the reservoir for the oil. The bigger your hydraulic cylinder, the bigger reservoir model you need, but the pump is the same. But I like this one because it's kind of small, about the size of a grease gun. So what I did <clears throat> is I got adapted from 3 8 pipe thread to 1 8 pipe thread. And I got a grease gun hose, so it's nice and flexible. And a, uh, you know, the little coupling chuck that clips onto the, uh, the, the, the grease zerks. Okay? And actually it's a little short. Maybe I want to put two together for some more length. But it's, it's much better than this big bulky hose, and this is just another quarter inch hose. I'm not sure why. I, somewhere I picked that up and it's still bulky. But I unhooked those, and I should probably just, I'm going to keep them, but I should probably get a new piece of hose to use it for what it's rated for. But uh, this grease gun hose, the, the grease um, zerk fitting, so I've been pumping oil through my hydraulic fittings with this. Um, I think I fit, this is supposed to be some kind of hydraulic fluid, usually 40, ISO 46. I put transmission fluid in there to pump through and clear out my fittings. Um, what I'm going to do is convert to that Lucas oil stabilizer, or that S, STP Motor Honey, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to put that real thick viscosity oil in there. It's about like 600 weight steam cylinder oil. And that's what I'm going to use instead of grease in this Hendy lathe. Um, just better lubrication. And it's going to stay put. So, too much talking. The uh, parts washing area with all my hand oil guns. More oil zerks I took out. Um, Let's walk over. Alright, so there's the handy tool and gauge maker lathe. Um, there's the cover, the wall, the front wall cover of the apron, okay? Um, I painted this, I got three coats of rust oleum smoke gray. I do not like this color. But it's what I used. Um, be nice to do a charcoal gray uh, two tone with smoke gray. Some parts charcoal gray, some parts uh, smoke gray. This is smoke gray. I hate machines that are all the same color as a battleship. I just do. But I'm in a hurry and, and whatever. I'm trying to use the paint up. So that's all th three coats brushed on there. So that's that's the front. Um, let me make sure I'm here when I use this for pointing. Um, I got, I got another, the Van Normans in, in the way, so I'm trying to get a good shot here, backing it up. I got the apron on, right? This is the apron, with all the stuff in there. It's on the feed rods. So, oh, I got my 2x4 here. I got to scooch through. Hold on, let me just... Get my body through here. All right. All right, here we are. So, what's the deal, Doozer? Um, so that's the lead screw for cutting threads, and that's the feed rod for the power feed crosswise, uh, cross slide, and, and the bed feed. And of course, there's your quick change box. So, da 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 da. So, the end bearings, that's the end bearings. On the feed rod, you can see it has a key way cut the whole length of it. So, you know, there's worm gears in there that slide on it and transmit the power to the clutches and onto the respective features. 
that keyway <clears throat> is, is not cut to the end, right? So there's ball bearings in there, and they take the thrust of the, uh, the lead screw anyways. There's not much thrust to the power feed rod. But the keyway is not cut to the end. And seeing as the gears and all the regalia are keyed inside the apron, you cannot get the apron off by, by, by taking the bearings off and sliding everything off the end. What they want you to do, and this is called a design language, folks. What they want you to do, the design is, you got to disconnect the feed rod at the very minimum here, and then take the feed rod out in order to get everything, you know, get this apron removed, and then it'll slide off. Why did they do that? Well, because to put it together, see, imagine the covers on this. If the covers on this, and you take this rod, let's say you take the care, um, the apron off, then a whole bunch of stuff falls apart inside. Okay. Go. All right. So, so there's the feed rod. Goes through. So there's a uh, a bushing in there, bronze bushing. That's keyed to the shaft. It's got actually a key in the bore of the bronze bushing. So these worms. I think this is the. Uh, Cross feed or longitudinal worm, I don't know. These worms have internal keys machined into them. There's another bronze bushing in the center here that also has a key. This other worm for power feed has a key. Now, when I say a, a key, it's a the the key feature is part of the gear. It's not a separate you know feature. It's for strength. And that bushing there is also keyed. So when you pull the feed rod out, that worm comes off, drops down, this worm comes off and drops down. And you cannot put this thing back together without having the front cover off like I have it. <clears throat> Feeding all this stuff and twit and you got twist everything for alignment. I use a little magnet and picked up on the worms to get them to fit. Huge pain in the butt, right? Huge pain in the butt. But that's how they did it. Now, it's interesting, these bronze bushings, why would they key a bushing? Well, it's interesting. The reason they key the bushing is so the bushing takes the wear rotating in this cast iron housing, right? The outside diameter, the OD, the outside diameter of the bushing purely spins in its bore in this cast iron case. So, as this carriage uh, apron moves along, the inner part of the bushing, uh, because it's keyed, you know, rotates with the shaft. It only sees linear wear. So that bushing in there only sees sliding wear on its ID, its inner diameter, its ID. So the, the, the inner part of the bushing sees sliding wear, the outer diameter of the bushing sees rotational wear. So that's why they do that. So it spreads the wear out. Otherwise, if you didn't key the bushing, it would see uh, straight line wear from traversing the apron and also rotational wear. And I guess it would wear it out twice as fast. So for longevity, that's what they do. I just wanted to cover this because it's an interesting design feature. Okay. Now, these clutches, these are the power feed clutches, right? I got them upside down, but you know, the break over, that's, that's the feed. What you got to do is before you put the shaft in, you have to put these power feed gears in and they just slide into the bore. They're just a bushing. Because if you were to put this shaft in and have the worms on it and everything straight 
together, you can't get these gears on because you can see it. I know I don't have the flashlight. These are enveloping uh, gears. I guess that's a, a worm. That's a worm wheel, worm gear, whatever you call it. So the worm wheels are single enveloping, right? So that means you can't push them while they're in their respective proper alignments. You cannot just push this gear and have it slide over the teeth of the worm because the worm goes inside the worm wheel. The, the worm wheel is undercut to receive the worm. And it's called, in, it's an enveloping uh, worm, worm wheel or a single enveloping uh, worm gear set. There is such a thing as a double enveloping worm gear set where not only the worm wheel is uh, concave and contoured to fit the worm, but the worm is concave and cut out to accept the worm wheel. That's double enveloping, okay? Um, just minor gear geekdom information there, but it's, 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 it's worth noting if you're a machine person and you're into you know, machines and gears and engineering type uh, stuff, which of course you all know I am, okay? So, what, how did I do this? Did I take this apart? Did, did I take this cover off and loosen that and pull all the key and regalia out? No. What I did is when I took this apart like 15 years ago, God, I can't believe it's been that long. When I got this apart the first time, I took this uh, feed rod and I extended the key way to the end, right? I extended that long keyway right out the end. So when I took this, so my thought was then I could take off and put on, uh, remove and install this apron uh, anytime I wanted. And I really didn't know that these worms would fall off the power feed shaft. But it worked out okay. Um, Incidentally, I used the mighty, mighty might uh, little 8520 clausing vertical mill with the Bridgeport head to mill, uh, to mill that keyway on the power feed rod like 15 years ago. Anyhow, so what I did last night, and I didn't film it, is I had this 2x4. It just spans the bed, right? It just so I can hold up the uh, the bottom of the uh, the apron. I had that set up down at the end of the the bed, and I I, I finger finagled the uh, the worms. I had to to get this the feed shaft again through the bushing, through the worm, through the secondary bushing, through that worm through the last bushing and they're all keyed so I had to make sure that I not only lifted the worms up while these uh, clutches were installed uh, I had to make sure that the key would line up with the key way so that was one one key two key three key four key five keys and uh, I had to deal with rotationally and I had to get a little magnet and pick up these two worms I think I had I can put the screwdriver in there and pry them up a little bit. Because um, when, when they were on the back wall, they were lined up with the bore. So I just used the screwdriver and found out that that worked pretty darn well. So, uh, yeah, that worked out really good. This is a really coarse screw. I think it's, uh, I don't know if that's a four pitch or a six uh, pitch threads per inch. Uh, you, you, it's really nice when you have a coarse lead screw on a lathe. That means you can cut, um, you know, two threads per inch, four threads per inch, one thread per inch. One thread per inch means this is way overdrive. Um, anyhow, uh, check this out. These had grease fittings in here. This is eighth inch pipe thread. And they go, there's a little flare in there. And these little lines, I think they're... What are these, 532nd or something? They go to feed the bushings 
for these uh, power feed levers. And here's my fancy, schmancy, sexy, licious handles from the Bridgeport uh, that I put on here instead of the ball knobs. So that's that's cool. But anyhow, I'm gonna try and get up from a kneeling position. So that's the whole the whole deal of where I'm at right now. Putting them on. Yeah. Maybe that'll help some of you guys. I really should have taken the uh, the power feed rod out of here to make it I could do it on the bench. But this worked out. I just had to support the apron down there and it worked out. But I wanted to make this video and document this stuff to show you guys uh, with Hendy's just what it takes to go inside of an apron. And it's very straightforward. Oh, so the Hendy has two worms and two worm wheels. The Monarch 10 has one worm and one worm wheel. So this has independent, completely independent power feed taken off the power feed rod. For the, the bed feed, I think this is the bed feed and this is the cross slide feed. There's a gear and da 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 and it goes up and it spins the, the cross uh, lead screw, feed screw. So this is probably a little bit more reliable and robust than the 10 double E. Um, this is a double wall apron. I don't know if you could call it sealed. I guess the Monarchs isn't completely sealed either. But this does not have oil in it. There is oil in the trough. Like these worms, like th this is called the trough and this gets full of oil. So the worms are constantly bathed in oil, okay? So that gets full of oil, but this is all dry and this is all meant to be grease lubricated. So I was going to put oil cups on here instead of grease fittings to lubricate these bearings for the clutch rollers and such. I might just put the fittings on again and just use them. And I'll tell you why because grease fitting, grease fitting, I shouldn't say grease fittings, they're zerk fittings. Um, I know I should have my flashlight, but maybe you can see there's four grease zerks down there. I keep, I keep calling them grease, they're, they're zerk fittings. And yes, I believe this lathe was designed to be used with grease. Here's another zerk fitting. I know everybody calls them grease fittings, and they kind of are, but they're kind of not. So I got like one, sorry, one, uh, four, that's five, six. There's supposed to be one. I got to get a deep one. Uh, it goes in that hole. Um, so let me show you this. Well, let me show you a Christmas tree. I'm kind of stepping around here. See that casting? It says grease, okay? So this is this is this is in the uh, this is for the uh, the power feed gear. It says grease right on this cover, right? You loosen that up. Come on, there you go. Take it off, and down in there is more grease fittings. See, zerk fittings. God, I keep saying it. But anyhow, based on the fact that. that it says grease there is another clue that this is supposed to have grease. But anyhow, I'm gonna keep that uh, oil high pressure injection gun and use it for the fittings on this lathe with that uh, motor honey stuff, you know. Um, incidentally, those power feed handles that I said they're from Bridgeport, this is what This is what they're from, right? Golly. I know my camera work. I'm doing this one-handed. But that's what the... That's what they're from. 
it's you know, it's probably too tight. But you can buy these from the Bridgeport supply people on like eBay or whatever, um, H and W or Matco or whatever. But that's just a sexy curve. That's a sexy teardrop shape. It almost looks like what are those called? Uh, a Rupert's drop. Look up Rupert's drop or maybe it's Saint Rupert's drop. I forget. Um, but anyhow, that's where it's from on a Bridgeport. And I think Bridgeport has the most attractive looking handles made by Ball Crank Corporation. I think I think that they bought these from Ball Crank. That, that Ball Crank only made handles. Right? So that's the uh, the Y axis lock, the X axis lock. Should have a similar same one, but it's got an Allen wrench brazed into a hex um, an Allen bolt. <laughs> it's a cap screw. So we, we need to remedy that. So this motor honey stuff, and I mentioned it before, here it is, Lucas Oil Stabilizer. And it's thick as honey, right? STP is the same thing, it's just different brand. That's what I'm gonna put in that, that ender pack gun, is this heavy duty duty stuff. So I'm waiting for parts for the Bridgeport head. Um, some people on Home Shop Machinist, uh, forget the gentleman's name, were asking about this and they made their own based on my video. Uh, how cool is that? I don't know the influence that my videos have. That's pretty sweet. Um, but there's some more pictures of the screws that... See this aluminum backing plate? Uh, that's where these screw into the edge of that plate. And I think those are 632 or some silliness. And, and this... Um, there you go. Is notched in. And I milled a, a little slot in that uh, quill stop piece. And again, that's how I made it. But like I said, someone at Home Shop Machinist uh, copied uh, my little bracketry design, and bravo. And this is just a similar same situation there, just a bracket. And I, like I said, I tapped these holes in there in the, uh, the Bridgeport head. These, these holes were not in there. But uh, the notches were, the, the little straight edge notches must be a machine guide, something from the factory. So that's how that works. And uh, thanks uh, to the people that noticed this. Uh, one thing my friend there on uh, Home Shop Machinist did, instead of putting the scale mounted to the front of these brackets, he mounted it to the back and saved a little more space and that was very clever see instead of putting this on the front the scale he put on the back so all you see is the little uh, ends of the screw nubbins on the front so that see somebody took my idea and made it better so I love that that's a good bunch of guys there in the uh, home shop machinist uh, forum and uh, I think I mentioned this before, this is cast iron. The one over here was broke, and I made a new one out of aluminum, and actually made it longer by a little bit. So uh, make your own stuff, right? When you're in a home shop, make your own stuff if you can. What the hey, right? All right. <clears throat> well, this is cool. This is an actual ball crank. Man, is it the same? Yeah, I can't... Uh, it's very much the same, but somebody broached it. And this this is made by Ball Crank Corporation for the square, right? And the Hendy, blah, the Gordon, it uses the the, uh, the square cranks, right? So there's the the bridge port, and that's a five eighths round bore with a one eighth key, and of course the the Gorton, the mighty Gorton, 9J, the or, the, or, the Orton, uses a uh, half inch square. And uh, this is a bigger one, right? Good Lord. Look at that. I know my fat fingers. That's a bigger one. There you go. Isn't that cool? Love that. That's neat. Boy, I'm telling you, that's just so cool. And uh, somebody 
did a shop fabricated one. See? My buddy Jim in Grand Island, New York, gave me this. Um, even got all the home homebrew welding there, which is fine, you know. So that's that, and then um, had this one for the vise. I don't know where I got that one, but I got that a long time ago. And I found this one. I think they were throwing this out at work. I don't remember. Um, and then this is also half inch bore. But look what they did. It was like three quarter bore or something. And somebody put in some like shims. And they welded them in, right? A little uh, porosity on that, but that's okay. So they, they reduced the bore by shim, put some shims in there and welding them in on the, the face. So whatever this was, probably three quarter, is now half. Right? There's some kind of K32. Okay, well, whatever. But that's that's sweet. And then uh, I said, boy, oh boy, that's going to work out super good, super well. Right? And the good thing about squares is you can turn them around and just kind of make them a little bit out of the way. I know, I, I love this stuff. I kind of geek out on it. I fixed this one a long time ago. It got uh, knackered, and I braze repaired it. Cast iron, man. Braze is the best way to repair a cast iron. It just is. Right? Because you get it hot to, to make it bond, and the, the bronze that you're using to braze is stronger than the iron. But it has, you know, similar hardness properties and uh, similar uh, um, ductile properties. So that's kind of neat. You got to get iron red hot, and then the braze will stick just beautifully. And there's like a little face serration there. I want to see if that's the same as the uh, the Polish mill I have. Anyhow, all right. I know it's a long babbling doozer video, but just wanted to kind of show you that and my beautiful handles, right? I know. I I I, I keep talking about the how, how I love these. It's just the shape of them. It's so so nice. Such a nice curve. It's an artistic piece. This 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 handle, right? Um, see, it's even nicer than that one. That one has a, a curve out, and this is so slender and skinny, and it's just, just a beautiful. I know my lighting's terrible, but in case you want to buy these, like I said, you can get them from any Bridgeport supplier. This was like $21 or something. And $21 for this piece of artwork? Oh my god, yeah. All day long. I know, I'm a little silly. Now, yeah, here's another handle, and I I geek out over this stuff, man. I just this is my Bridgeport tri uh, camera tripod. Way too many handles, but shape the human the human mind loves shape, right? If it's you know it mimics nature in 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 the, the the curves of beautiful things in nature, boy oh boy, it's a that's what art's all about, you know. Putting uh, shapes together in a aesthetically pleasing way. Darn, that's going to be nice when when this is all together and the covers on it. Oh, let me get you around here. So yeah, there's also a, a, a zerk fitting here to lubricate the bushing for the the half nuts. So this is kind of neat. That's for lubricating. I I think. This goes into this bore, this goes into that bore. So this Zerk fitting and this one, that, that one's missing, I gotta get one. These are quarter inch press fit. It lubricates. So those brass pipes, those brass pipes fill up the worm um, troughs, the oil troughs. Right? 
Yeah. Sorry. I said that backwards. So these pipes that fill up the oil troughs are these straight on fittings, right? These straight on fill up the oil troughs, these angle ones go to the bores. That angle one, which I gotta make make one or find one or get one, goes to the bores. Um, so that's cool. There's nothing around here because the shaft, see there's, a, there's one on that shaft for the gear, there's one on the shaft for the, the hand crank. Um, I hand painted this with a brush, three coats. Um, I painted this whole surface where the power feed um, clutch handle covers go and then I scraped it off with a razor blade for some contrast because I, I, I like a little bit of contrast and then I had painted over these screws because I never took out the mechanism for the half nuts and then I watched uh, Donnie's video Dee Dee and Walla Walla and he said oh you know one of the things that he does is he cleans out all the screw holes on his machines because uh, he saw a dealer that did that and it looks it look it makes the machine look fresh and new and not painted a whole bunch of times so I I took these screws out after I painted them wire wheeled them cleaned all and, and put them back in so they look distinctive uh, so thanks Donnie for that uh, I try to pick up tidbits from my friends uh, all over on the internet and everything um, yeah so that's clean that out what else was I going to talk about um, I don't know other than I got to get a, a grease fitting for that something something don't know so these holes, it, it, the bearing nuts go in there, right? And I, I, I made a spanner nut, a spanner socket for the spanner nuts for these. There's spanner nuts in there. But what I ended up doing, and I did this a long time ago, you just take a screwdriver, I'm trying to, sorry, you put it in the bore, and you use the screwdriver to wedge up into these guys to jam them and then you can use uh, I used channel locks with a piece of leather on them um, I don't know where my leather is oh here it is yeah always keep a piece of leather right um, what you do is you wrap the leather around the shaft that you don't want to scar and then you use vice grips or channel locks I think I used vice grips to hold this um, that's what you do and then you don't screw up your shafts I did the same thing on the the lead screw too just a piece of a hide that I was this is actually a piece of leather from the hides when I, I bought a hide to do the the, the chip guards the, uh, the weight covers on the Gorton that's uh, I bought a hide from Tandy Leather to make those and this is just a piece this I mean I use it for uh, doing that soft grip situation thing um, oh there's my light my lamp Man, yeah, I could do this again for my YouTube people. All right, maybe not, maybe not. Yeah, you can kind of see inside there. Huh. I, I used white paint marker and I marked where the key was. That's not reflection, it's actually white paint just to use to, to line those up better. So, is what it is. Actually, everything's clean. That's where the, the uh, there you go. Oh. I don't know. That's where the rack, that's where the pinion interfaces on the rack. It's, all right, whatever. Worst camera work in the world. All right. More to come. Do the shop.